Hello, welcome. Uh, as folks keep joining to tonight's Armchair Chat hosted by Run For Something, I absolutely please encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, make sure to change your settings to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see. Uh, tell us who you are, where you're coming from, if you're running for office, um, what you're running for, what campaign you're with, uh, make sure to share your pronouns. Um, I am really excited for tonight's conversation. Uh, we're gonna get started in about two minutes, maybe 90 seconds or so to give folks just a little bit of buffer. Um, but please do introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, let us know where you are, where you're coming in from, what campaign you're with, if you're with a campaign. I'm really excited for tonight's conversation. My dog is awake, she's amped. Uh, we are now live on Facebook. So hello, if you are tuning in on Facebook, we're gonna get started in about 60 seconds. Um, I encourage everyone who's here to please introduce yourself in the chat. I will say it again and again and again. Uh, make sure to change your settings to all panelists and attendees. Um, I see Audrey from Portland, Oregon is wanting to run for office. Audrey, we're so excited to have you. Uh, we're gonna be using the chat for a place for you to say hello, to, to interact with other people. The Q&A function will be where you ask questions for court. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, hi, Beverly from Florida, who assisted a friend to run for office. So glad to have you here. Jamil, or Jamil, I apologize. Atlanta, excited to learn. We're so excited to have you. I'm gonna give folks another 30 seconds or so to join. Um, as you are jumping on, please, again, I am just a broken record here. Introduce yourself in the chat, change your settings to all panelists and attendees. Love to see you we have uh, with us this evening. And let's get started. I'm sure more people will keep joining, but I am excited. Uh, my name is Amanda Littman. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the co-founders and the executive director of Run for Something. Run for Something recruits and supports young diverse progressives running for local office all across the country. Uh, the event you're joining tonight is one of our summer long series, Armchair Chats. We're having conversations with experts in the industry about how to campaign, how to navigate this new environment. What do you do when you can't knock doors and you shouldn't be knocking doors? And I'll say that many times over. Uh, it has been an incredible series so far. If you've missed any of the uh, conversations, they're all on our Facebook page. We've talked about online ads, we've talked about digital strategy. Uh, we've talked about organizing and movement. And tonight, we're talking about storytelling, which is perhaps the most important and the, the heart of any good campaign. Uh, these events are 100% free, no charge to join. Uh, that's in no small part because of our sponsors. So I want to take a quick moment to thank Act Blue, Ask Me, Authentic Campaigns, Fireside, Claire and Stephen Crouppen, Onward Together, Yelp, Precision Strategies, and our pals at Planned Parenthood, whose generosity has made this free for everyone. I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you to contribute to Run For Something. I'll ask you one more time at the end, and that's it. Uh, runforsomething.net slash build is where you go if you want to give. Uh, tonight, we're having a conversation about storytelling, and I am so, so excited uh, to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, Courtney the, is the founding, ex Courtney Tunis is the founding executive director of Pantsuit Nation and the head of activation at Supermajority. She's going to tell us a little bit about herself, going to love us out a little bit, then I have some questions for her, and then if you have any questions at all for her, uh, please do drop them in the Q&A at the bottom. I will pull from there, uh, make sure to give us any relevant context. I also, again, would encourage you to participate in the chat function, changing your settings to all panelists and attendees. It's fun the more times I say it. Um, <laughs> with that, Courtney, take us away. Thank you so much for having me, Amanda. I'm so thrilled. Um, it's been so great over the last almost four years now um, working together as our organizations have grown. Um, and this is just a perfect thing to be able to do right now. So thanks for having me. Um, so as Amanda mentioned, I'm Courtney Tunis and um, I started the Pantsuit Nation nonprofit along with Libby Chamberlain who founded the Pantsuit Nation Facebook group just before the election in October of 2016. And at the heart of Pantsuit Nation since the beginning has been storytelling. And the stories have um, really ranged from why people were initially supporting Secretary Clinton at the time to um, why they were getting involved in their community after the 2016 election 
And eventually it really moved towards a number of people talking about their own running for office. And so as Run for Something was really recognizing this need for giving people resources when they were stepping up to run for office for the first time, we were seeing a parallel track of people talking about why they wanted to do this. And what was really cool in Pantsuit Nation is that because we have normalized storytelling as the communication platform, a lot of people were coming and telling stories in a slightly different way than we were hearing kind of the more traditional candidate story being told. So I think we're used to, um, well, a lot of things have changed. You know, it's no longer that you can only be a candidate if you're sort of the anointed one or someone that has always been on that path. It's really anyone who wants to be of service in this way is now able to stand up because of organizations like this one that let you know how to do it, help you get in touch with the people People, but also just the success of that we've seen in the last um, three, four years of people stepping out and saying, I'm going to take this, um, I'm going to take this on and being successful. So um, I, I think that there's sort of two traditional stories that we're used to hearing. There's the um, candidate who's saying, you know, I met this person and this is their story and I'm going to tell you that. And one of those examples that I always think of is the sort of like Joe the plumber from the McCain campaign. You remember him? Um, who be becomes this kind of stand in for a type of person that that candidate is trying to talk to. Um, and I think that those stories have, they really run the risk of um, becoming kind of tropes rather than being authentic stories. And um, I think Joe the Plumber is a really good example of that. Um, and then the other version is the story of the candidates themselves. And there are so many different types of moments where people are telling those stories, whether it's why they got involved or illustrating a specific um, thing that is meaningful to them, a variety of different things. And there are ways that this can really work and ways that this can kind of not work as well. Um, an example I think of something that works really well um, is I, we're probably all familiar with Elizabeth Warren's story about um, her mom putting on her church dress and going out and getting the job um, that supported her family. And what works so well about this is that this is a story that has so many different angles that you can enter it from. That she talks about her father having a heart attack and being the reason why her mom needs to go work. And that's a healthcare angle and a, a um, caregiving angle. She talks about um, her mom going to get this job and that is a, and then her family being able to survive on this single salary. And that is a, um, a wage conversation. And there's an entry point for her mother as a caregiver and the head of the family. And that's an entry point for not only women, but people who are responsible for the people around them. Um, and even though Elizabeth Warren has been a politician longer than many of the other people who we're talking about, um, I think that this story really has a freshness because she was thinking about that 360 degree way of having an entry point. And what I saw organically in Pantsuit Nation was people telling stories that were similar to that, that had this, um, rather than a sort of rote feeling that I've told this a million times, um, it felt like this is the authentic entry point that I had to doing this work or this is the authentic entry point I had to learning about this person who I would do it on behalf of. Um, and so storytelling as a candidate has become a more dynamic thing that I think we've ever seen in the past and has become a something that you can do in a different way than we have seen in the past, that you can do through live video, that you can do through produced video, that you can do through your Twitter account, through your Facebook posts. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about all of the different ways that candidates can um, access storytelling and happy to get this discussion started. Ugh, that story that Elizabeth Warren tells, it makes, I can hear it a hundred times and I will cry. I know, times. that's the best part is yeah. that you know the story and you're like, tell it again. <laughs> When you think about that or the most compelling things you've seen in Pantsuit Nation from candidates or from others, is there some common thread among them besides the sort of 360 entry points that makes them compelling, whether it's structure or format uh, or tone that, that really gives them the sort of the X factor? You know what yeah. I mean? 
Um, so this is going to sound really basic, but I think it's missing from a lot of the stories that we can hear sometimes. And that is that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the end is always, and that's the reason why I'm the right person to do this job. And so the beginning and the middle can be structured in different ways. And you mentioned a few different things. It can have different tones. Maybe this is a joyful tone um, because I'm celebrating my experience and I can't wait to bring that energy. Or maybe it's a reflective tone about the leaders that they've encountered in their lives that are inspiring to them. But that important part of closing it out, of saying, and this connecting to the parts of the story that I've told is why I'm doing this or is why I want your vote or is why I would like your donation, whatever that might, that ask might be. Um, and sometimes I think it's difficult to not get distracted away from landing that final point. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why um, like practicing telling your story is really important um, because it gives you an opportunity to, and I think this is another moment that Senator Warren does well, practice all the different ways that maybe you will need to land that point, um, that you might get asked a question in the middle of it and how do I not forget to come back to that? Or maybe this, you know, it started out as a story that you told with a joyful tone, but the um, political moment is not really about joy and you have to pivot that and talk differently about it. Um, landing that point at the end is really important. Um, and then the second thing that I think is just the most important is that it really just needs to be authentic. Um, and that's, again, one of those things that seems like so easy, but I think it's very, um, uh, you know, I have a lot of advice. One of them I think is to actually ask people in your lives um, is this a story that you think really reflects my, you know, stance on this or how I would behave in this circumstance? And they might say back to you, you know, I actually think this moment is better. And you might be kind of thinking of, of it in a different way. And having someone who is sort of a mirror to you rather than yourself can actually um, give you more of a sense of how to talk authentically in a way that will connect with that person who is represented by, you know, your friend or family member who you asked about that story. So thinking about authenticity, not just coming from inside yourself, but coming from how you have landed with the other people in your life before. Okay, I have so many questions. I wanna start with the thing you ended on, which is authenticity, which especially for women and candidates of color is like a very uh, electric word. Mm. Can you talk a little bit both about that as a, as a way of telling story, but also as how do you incorporate the way that your story is going to be perceived into the way you tell it? Yes. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many different like lightning rod <laughs> points on this. Um, one of the things I think that's really important is um, to remember that um, there are of like the, there's a difference between perfection and precision. And so you don't have to be perfect when you're telling your story. That's not important. Um, what's important is that you are precise about the things that you're trying to land and that those points are the ones that get through. And if you, know, you have different things about your life that aren't pretty, um, that that's okay because they are informing that story about yourself that you are telling precisely. Um, so, and this is not something, I mean, this is something easy to say. It's something that requires, again, practice. And it's not practice to say, you know, I've memorized this story. The practice is more about, you know, this part of the story maybe is difficult for me to talk about because it's personal or painful. Let me practice how I work through that moment as I'm talking to people about this story. And so you can hold on to those things that are usually like the, the most critical crux moments, those, those things that really humanize you to the people that you're talking about, but can sometimes be vulnerable. Um, it's about practicing kind of sitting in that vulnerability and being able to speak through it or write through it um, and still present at the end something that, you know, when, when someone who knows you really well sees it, they would say, you know, yes, that's you, that's you. Um, so when I think about women, when I think about people of color, that means, you know, don't 
you don't have to think about using language that a man would use or that a white person would use. Um, using the language that connects with your culture, with your experience, um, that is, you know, what brings the critical diversity that we need to leadership is those kinds of differences in language, those kinds of differences in perspective. Um, we know that literally like there's data that diverse teams do better work. Um, so elevating how you will step differently into a room is actually making you a better candidate for the job. Um, so remembering that it's okay to be um, that version of your authentic self and that the parts that are important to remember are those precision parts. You know, what is the date of the election? <laughs> That's a really important thing to remember. Or, um, you know, what's the, the name of the organization that you want to highlight in the speech that you're talking about? You know, these moments of precision, um, but that perfection piece, you know, try and push that off a little bit. I think a lot about one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten, it's actually twofold. One is that a persona is not a person and that who you are as a candidate is not the whole of your identity. Yeah. And, and this is, I think, was from Tom Periello to Leah Greenberg, or good friend, to, to me was, as much as possible, try and keep the divide between that persona and your person as small as you can. Because it will, at some point, it will be hard to navigate. And I think that's something we know a lot of our candidates have struggled with, is entering into the identity as candidate and feeling like it's an uncomfortable skin to wear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as you think about a, uh, telling a story as a, in service of a campaign, um, how do you decide what not to tell? I think this is a great, um, a really great question. Um, I, I really do, I think that part of the sort of practicing of telling these stories is understanding how your stories are landing and how they are, um, it's not so much like, oh, don't tell that story, people don't want to hear that. It's more like, did they walk away thinking about the thing that I wanted them to walk away thinking about? You know, am I telling this story that people end up getting distracted by, you know, this shiny thing over here when really I want them to be thinking about, you know, how I would act on the school board when it comes to school lunch or something along those lines. Um, if they're getting stuck on something else, um, then, that story is not effective for what you're trying to do. Maybe it's an effective story for a different part of your campaign or something else that you're, um, that you're working on. Um, but if it's not landing, and there's good ways to kind of test this, that you can you know, sort of pull people after events with you. If you write something on Facebook or the internet, like what are the comments um, catching on to? What are people you know, following up about? Um, and that can give you a sense of you know, how something is landing. Um, I think that the other, th I don't know. I, it's hard for me to say like uh, a, um, blanket what not to talk about. Um, I do think it's more giving yourself the permission to not tell a story if it's not serving you. And that's, I think, the most important thing, that if that's not doing the thing it needs to do, then it's okay to set that one aside. And especially for women, there's a certain hesitation about telling personal stories, about feeling like you're bragging about your accomplishment. And this is something super majority thinks about a lot. Yeah. Um, for people who don't like talking about themselves, um, how do you reframe this or do you have any advice? That's a really good question and definitely something that um, women in general are, um, many of us are working to overcome. And I think I was talking a little bit about the sort of Joe the Plumber trope story um, and surrogates are one of the ways that candidates can sort of have stories about themselves that are um, told through someone else and someone else's experience. And so there is, of course, that like asking a surrogate to talk about you, which is nice. But I think, and you can also talk about your experience with um, someone else and how your interaction with them um, has either changed your path or um, affected their lives. And I think the most important thing, again, with um, when you're bringing that story in is to think about um, the outcomes rather than framing it, if you're not comfortable with framing it around yourself, 
frame it around the outcomes of the experience that you were a player in. So what was at the start of this that was the problem or the thing that needed to be addressed? What was your, in, like, how did you insert yourself into this? What did you do? What happened? And then what came out the other side? And that doesn't have to be, you know, I was triumphant. It can be my community was triumphant. It can be, you know, that this is now a staple of, you know, the school day. I'm thinking a lot about school, um, <laughs> about the uh, school board. Um, this is now a staple of the school day. And so, your accomplishments when you are an elected official are community accomplishments. And those are things that are um, kind of easy to talk about because you get to brag on your community and the, the people that are there and the things that you're proud of there. Um, so I think that that's a way that you can sort of flip it um, if you're uncomfortable talking about that stuff. The other thing is if you're not uncomfortable talking about that stuff, that's also okay. And it's, um, I think you're going to, as a woman, as a person of color, you're going to experience people saying, oh, they're too cocky, oh, they're too this, they're too ambitious, as we've heard already um, with the Democratic VP pick. And I think that's one of those things that um, you know inside why you're doing what you're doing. And ambition is not a negative thing when your ambition is to get to a place where you can do the most good that's okay. That's a great ambition to have. Um, and so being a balance of, you know, what are the results of my ambition, um, I think is, is a really important way to frame that um, so that you can talk about yourself and brag uh, in a way that feels comfortable for you. Yeah, I think it's a lot like fundraising. You know, you're not asking someone for lunch money, you're asking them to invest <laughs> in their community and invest in your collective future. It is not a, you know, give me 20 bucks for a very nice burrito. It's give me $20 because I want to make our, our schools better, our streets safer, our, our home a better place to live. Um, it's not really about you. And I think that's also true of the criticism. The criticism is not really about you. Yes, um, absolutely. One of the things that you guys have done in Pantsuit Nation and Supermajority really well um, is cultivate this community in which it's a vibrant conversation that, isn't, that is sometimes has a lot of disagreement, but is very vibrant. Um, I have found that personally as, like a, as an intellectual exercise just incredibly interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and the way that you guys handle moderation and building community online? Sure. Well, yes, it's very vibrant in there and we do that on purpose. Um, you know, when you start a, an online community, you have an opportunity to set the guidelines that you want people to um, behave within. And we wanted there to be the ability for people to raise questions, push back. Um, and we set up, we do have some things that are, you know, no go. There are things that you cannot do. Um, so for example, transphobia is something that we have no time for. Um, and so if that happens, um, we take the time to educate that person around why they're you know, why what they're saying is problematic, why that's not acceptable here. Um, but there's a short leash on something like that. But there are areas where people can have disagreements about, um, you know, around candidates is a really good one <laughs> that people have often. Um, and what we try to do is model what a disagreement can look like without it getting nasty. And the internet is so easy to get nasty. You're not actually talking to that person. You're not in front of them. You, in this sense, you may not even know them. Um, but our moderators are really well trained at de-escalating. So reminding people that you know we don't call names and we um, you know we don't just like drop a bunch of sassy memes at each other if we're trying to have an actual conversation. Um, and doing the work of saying you know this is what I'm hearing is that what you meant? And that is so often the, the miscommunication where it happens on the internet is that someone will read something and have a tone in their head or have a context that they apply to it um, that isn't necessarily what that original person who wrote it meant. And so when our team is able to go in and sort of navigate between those things, um, then it helps open up those conversations to actual conversations and not just stopping at that misunderstanding point. 
Um, and what's cool is that over the course of the time that we have run this community, we've actually seen more people in the community be able to do this themselves, that not necessarily take at face value or take at their, what they think is face value, a comment and say, you know, what did you mean by this? And then that can generate conversation. And sometimes the person did mean the thing that you think they did. And that's, you know, you dive into that. But starting with what did you mean by that, rather than, you know, a hit at that person means that even if they did mean the thing that you didn't want, you're already in a place where you've kind of brought the tone, the um, temperature down and you can disagree with that person and not necessarily have it turn into a blow up. Or you can find out that actually you are on the same page. You were just expressing it differently, or maybe you've got 80% in common and you decide to agree to disagree about the 20% or whatever that might be. Um, so a lot of it is just modeling, 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 um, and being very firm about no goes and very firm about um, community rules, um, but recognizing that conversation and dialogue is critical to what we're doing, our, our project of trying to make this country a better place, because multiple ideas and multiple pers perspectives are necessary in order to do that. I think it's a really interesting um, example for campaigns to model, especially for candidates to think about how do you interact with people you're going to disagree with? And how do you take what can be a very contentious conversation with a voter, maybe you meet at an event or at the on the phone, you know, at the doors, if we were doing, still doing doors, um, <laughs> how do you lower the temperature on that so that you can have a conversation starting with common language? So for those who aren't a member of Cancer Nation, I, I could watch you guys navigate those comments for hours. I find it to be so interesting and such a good example of community. The moderator team is so top notch. They do such an incredible job. I'm not in there as much as I used to be, so I can't take credit for the most recent work, but um, we're, we're just so lucky that so many people have been willing to dedicate their time to keeping this community as vibrant as um, it has been for almost four years. Um, this is a really good segue to a question from Jamil, and I apologize, Jamil. Um, can one's social media presence, and more importantly, a lack of social media presence, change the way that we view their story? Um, do candidates right now have to use social to tell their stories? Um, how do you think about these different platforms as vehicles for, for connecting? Yeah, that's that's such a good question, especially as, um, you know, one thing that pops up into my head again is that that question of authenticity. I hate to keep using this word, um, but if you as a person are not a social media user, then it's okay to have your social media presence be primarily your sort of campaign presence and not be that person. And, you know, one thing I think of that I, uh, I think is actually really effective um, is I, I can't remember, I think it was like the, the White House when like Barack Obama would write tweets, he would sign it like B.O. And I thought that was brilliant. Like this is a moment when you can differentiate between when my campaign is talking and when this is a message from me directly. So if you're a person that's not that interested in being on social media, but every once in a while will want to talk, um, that's, a, that's a way to do that. Um, as a, if you're a constant social media user and you jump into a campaign, um, I think that, uh, you know, that's a critical piece of how you communicate and how you talk about your values, how people learn sort of who you are. Um, I think now a lot of people have really locked down social media, so maybe there's not as much access to that as before, um, but I, I wouldn't be as, um, I don't know, I, I guess I'm a little bit different because I've been in this Facebook group and I, <laughs> I feel differently about it. Um, but I think that there's opportunity to use that in really meaningful ways and the, um, especially on Facebook, you know, you can make changes about what posts are seen by the public in general and what are seen just by your friends or by a small community of people and taking advantage of those kind of tools so that you do have that um, sense of privacy for things that you want to keep private, but also your ability to talk more globally about things that you want to get out there. Um, I think the lack of social media presence question is really important. And I think that um, 
being okay, or if you join social media because you're a candidate, like being open about that, talking about that, saying I'm here because I think that this is where people I want to talk to are, and so I'm coming to you, um, that's okay. And saying, you know, I might like get this wrong because I'm new, you know, you might see a typo or, you know, I might, all the kinds of things that we all have done before in our social media posts. Um, again, just coming back to like, who is the real person behind the persona? And if the person behind the persona is a newbie at posting on Instagram, then being okay with sharing that and um, learning along the way. Um, I think you could ask people for advice about how they like to do things when you're gaining followers and, and having that build your, um, your, uh, your presence there. Um, but yeah, I, I do, I think that, um, I think that you do need to be on social media to tell your story. Um, I know for the people who don't like social media, that's a different, difficult answer, um, but I really do. I think that it's just, it's such an inexpensive, quick way to get yourself in front of so many people, get your story out there, that um, there are a lot of things that are difficult about navigating it, but there's just such a huge benefit if you are thoughtful about how you show up on those platforms. And I think this actually comes back to something, the dog is up. It comes back to something you said earlier, which is understanding how your story is going to be perceived. Um, your social media platforms are not your group chat. <laughs> and I feel like it's a really important thing to keep in mind. Everything you yes. post on any singular platform needs to be strategic and in service of a goal. You might be a throwaway tweet or a throwaway story. It needs to be in service of a goal. This is working from home now. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, again, going back to authenticity, um, especially across these different platforms. How do you think about storytelling across these different spaces online, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever platform it is someone chooses to use? Um, so I think this is one of the things that has really been interesting to see in Pantu Nation. Um, and... It's what has really stood out to me is that there's a traditional way, you know, you might read like about a candidate on their website and they'll have, you know, I'm the, this person and it will talk about them and what they've done and why they're doing this. And if you just copied and pasted that into um, a Facebook post or, um, you know, one of those like blurbs on Instagram when people take a picture of their notes pad, um, those aren't gonna land the same way because that is something that has been edited, it's gone through multiple versions and you can tell, you know, it's, it's polished up because it's on the landing page on the website. And what lands so much better on these other sites are a lot closer to like a journal entry or a letter to a friend. Um, the way that you um, talk about yourself when you're not thinking about that like really heavily polished edited version. And because that's how everyone else is using the platform and you don't wanna stand out as the thing that doesn't seem to fit. Um, and when you have that too um, formal thing when you're on social media, that can really fall. Um, and so it doesn't mean that you're not um, taking a critical look at what you're writing. It's just making sure that the writing that you're doing on there is, uh, is really like matching how that area flows. Um, and I think that that is where you can get caught up and especially um, not making a change between different platforms, not, you know, thinking that what works on Facebook is going to work on Twitter, is going to work on Instagram. I don't know if candidates are TikToking these days, but um, th that those things have different tones, different paces, and making sure that you're differentiating between those um, is really important as well, because it's just not... Um, it's not one size fits all when it comes to these different platforms. But I think the most critical piece is that um, these things are not static. And so your, your writing cannot feel that kind of static that it feels when you're on a, a landing page on the website. Um, I just had a question for you. It was about 
it'll come back to me. Um, <laughs> in the meantime, in the Q and A, someone wants to know about if someone tells a negative story about you, someone calls you nasty in this example, do you have advice for how to twist that or how to incorporate that into to how you're, you're sharing your story? Yeah, that's really difficult. Um, what, so, so many people in Panther Nation have, who are candidates for things have had this moment that it is that part of what has galvanized them it, to, to run for office or to step into a new um, leadership space is that moment when someone told a, a nasty story about them or told them that they couldn't do something or cut them down in some way. Um, and so, you know, what is at the heart? I think, you know, you said this very well, um, that there's always something at the heart of the criticism. What is at the heart of that criticism? And how are you actually, you know, countering that? What is the difference between um, a world where that criticism is true and what you know to be the truth and picking that up and saying, okay, you know, you think I'm a nasty woman. Um, is that because I, you know, stood up for people when they were, um, you know, being talked down to? Um, and yeah, like I'm proud that in that moment I stood my ground. Um, and so there's various ways to think about dissecting the, uh, the other person's story about you because you don't want to like, you know, there's some things you can just ignore, <laughs> but if you choose not to ignore it, you want to be able to have touch points to that other story that says, you know, this is what I heard, but you know, here's what I'm reflecting back to you um, in a light that is not only positive, but also goes back to again, that beginning, middle and end and the end being, this is why I'm the right person for the job. You know, if this is what you're seeing and you're calling it nasty, here's what I'm actually doing and here's how it's been beneficial and here's the reason why that is going to get me um, over the line or why, you know, our community will be better if I'm the person in the lead. Bless you. Thank you. Um, I think a lot about Ann Friedman's um, disapproval matrix. Have you ever seen this, Court? I'm going to drop this in the chat for those who have it. Please do and I will take a look. I mean, um, I it's basically like whose criticism do you take seriously and whose do you ignore? And I think about that a lot as it relates to like, especially online feedback and, and online relationship building of who's a hater, who's actually worth investing in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that frenemy block, that is the one you have to watch for. Um, <laughs> that's the one that's gonna be, um, it's, I think that that line is, permeable and um yeah very challenging and i also i love the critics box um because that critical side of the work is so instructive like that's such an instructive thing to learn when you know that you can take yourself personally out of it and get the feedback on the work um, that's actually such a useful thing to have. Um, and that means that sometimes, you know, a friend can give you similar feedback that a critic who doesn't know you will give you. And you could hear it better from the person who doesn't know you than the person who does, just because you don't have that emotional um, attachment to that person. So, um, yes. Yeah, and I know that, uh, you know, Court and I are in a group chat together that is often sharing some of our, our feelings it is okay to have spaces in which you ask people, like, is this a good story? As you said earlier, is this a good tweet? Can someone approve this? Like, it is never a bad idea to ask for feedback. Mm -hmm. Especially if people mm -hmm. know you really, really well. Yeah, I do that um, pretty constantly. <laughs> and, you know, we write, we write a lot in Pantsuit Nation, um, you know, as ourselves, the people who are the moderators and then leaders of the group. Um, you know, when you see a message come from us, we've drafted it, but it's very rarely going out without our community of um, admins taking a look at it because, you know, as you said, how's this going to land? And did I say this, but I mean something else and it's just, you know, running through my head in a certain way and not another way. So yeah, those trusted people who will be 100% willing to tell you the truth and tell it like it is, um, is important. And also having that internal compass of knowing, like, if they tell me that this is a consequence, 
I have to know whether I'm willing to take on that consequence or not, and what the level of that is, because maybe the thing you say is, um, you know, you've deemed it important enough to take the consequences that your trusted circle has suggested will happen. Um, but maybe you're like, ooh, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I am definitely gonna change that word or, you know, journal about this rather than tweet about it. <laughs> um, Stacey Hodge in the Q&A wants to dig in a little bit more about common tropes thrown at women and how you might prepare for them. Um, you can, knowing in part that a lot of it comes, you know, they're not really mad at you, they're mad at what you represent uh, or they're angry at what you represent. Do you have any sort of like, maybe maybe three of the most common things that you have seen you know, women have get thrown at them that, that you've seen positive rebuttals for or responses to that you found inspired? Yeah. Okay, these are, these are, I'm trying to, I'm like three. Uh, yeah, let me narrow that down. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, as many as you'd like. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that, um, so let's just start with the one that we talked about before, too ambitious um, or, you know, gold digger, or I don't know, the, the, the version of you're doing this work, not because you want to see the goal that we all share, but because you want to get something for yourself. This, this version of criticism, which is so often um, put on women, which is so crazy to me since women are so often so selfless in the work that they do. But anyway, um, so I, I used to be a recruiter um, and I recruited for things like presidents of colleges and that kind of thing. And in the recruiting work, um, I and I hold on to this, is that the, the, best, um, the best indicator that you will be able to do the job is demonstrating that you have done it before. And that does not mean I've held office before and so I've done this. What it means is I have demonstrated the skills necessary to get results and I have gotten results before. And so being able to say, you know, when someone says, oh, you're just ambitious, being able to go to those stories that you've thought about and tested with your friends and family and the, you know, on in the early stages of your campaign and say, you know, here's a moment where I did step out and I, um, you know, put myself out there in a way that uh, took charge or whatever um, ambition might have looked like in that circumstance. Um, and here's the positive outcome from it that was about something larger than myself. And so being able to demonstrate, yes, I have done this before when someone calls you ambitious, too ambitious. Um, you know, too ambitious, if you get great results, is just more great results. And so having the ability to say, you know, this is how my ambition for us can um, push us forward. So I think that's a really important one. Um, gosh, uh, I, I, there's some that I just don't, I have not figured out how to get around. So women are going to be criticized for their appearance all the time. And that one is really difficult because there's really not anything you can say to rebut someone who criticizes, you know, your makeup or your hair or your clothes or something like that. Um, in that sense, I think the most important thing is just to be super authentic to yourself. And we have, um, you know, seen a variety of different women that are hit at in these different ways who have found different ways that they deal with it. Um, so I think a really good example is like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is hit at for, you know, oh, you're not supposed to have any money, but you have all of these fancy clothes. And she's like, yes, I rent them. I'm so glad you asked. Here's this great resource for women that want to look good and don't necessarily have the budget. So how are you thinking about why you are sitting in that space that you're sitting in? Um, and if you choose to respond, you know, what is the way that makes you feel better? I mean, uh, I'm a person who doesn't really like to wear a lot of dresses. I like pants and that can make people think that you're this sort of like, you know, ball busting uh, lady monster. Um, and when you say it's easier to get out of cars and get up and sit down and do all that stuff when you're wearing pants, 
there's not a lot that people can say back to you. That's not the only reason why I like to wear them, but finding that one thing that just like dismantles the, the criticism um, can be really helpful. Um, another thing that I think is a critical, a criticism of women is just, you know, how can you do this if you're, if you have a family? How can you do this if you have all of these other, you know, you're not going to have enough time to, you know, no, no one's ever really concerned that you won't be a good mother to your children, I will say. They are just trying to cut you down, but that can be the argument. Um, and I think that that's another moment where you can talk about, look, I've done this before. You know, multitasking is my way of life. And um, here's another example of me already having done what needs to be done. Or here's an exa another example of me, you know, seeing a problem, figuring out a solution and coming up with, and, and the result being a positive thing on the other side. Um, and I think that, that women who are um, criticized in this way are getting better at owning their identity as caretakers and saying, you know, this is actually something that makes me an even more um, empathetic leader, um, a leader that sees beyond um, myself. Um, and that is a really great way, I think, to counter that. Um, I think on the other side of that coin is, oh, you're, you're not a mother. You're, you know, just this uh, ambitious person who's out there doing everything for yourself. And um, the, again, I think it's just so much about going back to your own stories in your own life. And you know the truth about why you're doing what you're doing. And you know that it's because of other people. And that's why people run for office. It's because of other people. So what is the story that, um, that you can bring to the fore when someone criticizes you that says, you know, um, when, when someone talks, talks about me being a, uh, you know, cutthroat single lady out in the world, um, I think about my friends that I talk with every day about our work and how we're challenged and how we run it by each other and how often I am part of this support system. Um, and so there's these different things in your life, you know, mine, the whole thing, you know, really think beyond what you have come to understand as the stories candidates tell, because that is going to be the thing that people are like, oh, I relate to that. Oh, I relate to that. So just, you know, push those walls out of what you think, um, is appropriate to talk about um, because I think more often than not, you're going to find more examples of ways to counteract those criticisms than less. Yeah, my I loved all of your your responses. I, my personal favorite, especially when someone asks like a pretty rude or dumb question, is like is to play confused. Hmm, why would you ask that? Because when you force, it's like making someone explain the joke. When you have yep. to actually think through it, they look real bad. Ooh, I love asking people to explain the joke. So I'm going to take this one out into the world. I love that. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about women getting criticized for their appearance. And I think as, especially um, given how much of our storytelling is now online and is deeply visual, it's even more, uh, it can feel even more like a high barrier if you're self-conscious, which we all are. Um, in the anonymous questioner in this notes, um, I'm personally very self-conscious about appearance. I've never faced criticism, but I fear it to the point that I overcompensate. Mm -hmm. and, um, do you have any advice for, for them? So this is, a, this is really difficult, and it's especially difficult because it is so intensely personal. Um, and I think that this, the questioner is a great example. You know, I've never faced criticism, but the version of my fear is worrying that it's coming. And then there are people who have faced criticism and they have that, you know, knee-jerk reaction. Or there are people who, um, you know, they've been feeling like they're overcompensating the entire life and they want to pull back and they don't know how. You know, there's just so many different types of this. And this is another one where I really think that practice is so critical. Um, that those small, small doses that start to inoculate yourself against those kinds of things. And maybe it's as small as 
you know, I talk to a friend on the phone every week and this week, um, sorry, motorcycle, um, this week we're doing a video call and it's, and it starts with you, you know, showing your face or your outfits or your voice or whatever it is that you're um, worried about to more people, um, on a sort of smaller basis and then moving out from there. Um, I also think, and I do this, I have like, um, I have comfort items that I will wear or I'll have like a lucky shirt or the, um, you know, my favorite pair of pants. And it's so funny to me how, you know, I might go on a trip and I will be gone for a week and I will have, you know, five days of things that I need to do. And I will bring all of these different outfits. And if I have a favorite thing that makes me feel empowered when I wear it, I will wear it as much as I can on the course of that trip. And so finding that thing that makes you feel like really good and, you know, maybe it's a lipstick color. Maybe it's a favorite pair of glasses. I have about 10,000. Um, maybe it's a, um, you know, a piece of jewelry that when you touch, it reminds you to center yourself. Um, there are like very real physical things that you can include um, for yourself that can help, um, that can put you in a space where you're feeling, um, even if you're not feeling 100%, um, if you can make yourself 5% more comfortable or 10% more comfortable, and I'm stealing this directly from an amazing woman. Um, her name is Jalfa, and she is doing our um, weekly meditations over at Supermajority. And she's been talking about um, making yourself more comfortable when you're meditating. You know, if you're sitting in your office chair, is it uncrossing your legs that makes you slightly more comfortable? And I think that this is actually really universally applicable because maybe you can do it if you're feeling 50% strong. And if you're at 45% strong and you feel like you can't, what's that one thing that you need to get that 5% more strength so that you can show up and do the thing? Um, and so whatever it is that that is, maybe it's a mantra that you say before or any kind of thing, um, testing out a bunch of different things, practicing that among your family members and friends and, and trusted colleagues, um, and then putting it into action, seeing what works. And also, ooh, so important, is not beating yourself up if something doesn't go the way that you think it does. Um, also, ev everyone is going to get attacked on the internet. So just remembering that that's not about you. <laughs> that's about the internet and the internet's problem. Um, and really not taking any of that to heart. Don't read it if you can avoid. Um, that's very important. Um, but also knowing that you get another shot and so you can do it better the next time. Um, Court, did you watch AOC's uh, makeup video for Vogue? I have not yet, but I've had a bunch of people send it to me, and apparently I have to buy this lipstick, I've heard, mm -hmm. that's so fantastic. Yes. So I don't, I don't always like, wear makeup at events, but like I haven't really put on makeup since the pandemic started, I'm not wearing makeup this evening. It does not, it is not something that necessarily sparks joy for me, like it does for many people, which is great. You, it is worth watching that Mitt video. One, because I think she is just incredibly interesting to listen to but also the articulation of how it feels to, to put on a face, to, to armor up for the world um, and to do, as you say, like the thing that makes you feel confident, mm -hmm. whether that's lipstick or hair or your favorite pair of sneakers, it does not necessarily need to be even appearance. It, it is a thing that makes you feel like yourself, like your most comfortable self. Um, it is worth watching this video. It is 17 or 18 minutes. I both learned a lot about contouring and found it to be deeply interesting. Oh my gosh. I wanted to learn contouring during um, <laughs> lockdown and I tried it like three times and it was such a disaster. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna find a new project, <laughs> but maybe I'll pick it back up now that I'll see the video. It's so good. Um, okay, another really good anonymous question. I think this is maybe one of the last ones we have time for. Uh, since we can't be around people, this is an anonymous, um, the best way to gain persuasion, storytelling, debate skills in this moment? Ooh, good one. Okay, great question. Um, this is going to be crazy because I, I, this is a suggestion that's going to seem crazy, but jump in online. I know that sounds nuts because I just said the internet is terrible and a mess, but not all of it is. And so if you can find groups 
that you enjoy being in. And this is not, it doesn't even have to be about politics. It can be about anything. I'm in a seltzer group, I'm in a plant group and people have, yes, a seltzer appreciation group, it's real. And people have disagreements in there all the time. And if you just start to comment on things, you're gonna get interactions with people and you can practice some of those skills in these really like low risk situations. You know, jump in on a conversation about whether or not a snake plant or a ZZ plant is like the best plant for a first time person and hone your little edges around the stuff that, um, you know, around how you're thinking about arguments and that kind of thing. The other thing is that you're gonna have, you. You definitely have people in your life who you don't agree with stuff on, who you love, and you already know that. And so you can ask that person to engage in a conversation with you. Now, this is pick carefully because you want to choose a circumstance where you're not going to cause a rift in your relationship. But I know that some of my best skills that I have taken back to work at Pantsuit Nation have been after I've interacted with people in my real life, either via text or on the telephone or by email um, about things that have needed those skills of persuasion or those um, skills of uh, bringing someone along to something that maybe they don't necessarily have, think that they have an interest in yet. Um, so definitely, again, kind of be tapping into your network. Um, yeah, I think those are the two that I would, I would add, like really practicing in a low, low stakes environment. Um, it's also just kind of nice to be like talking with new people online right now when you're not uh, able to see people. So you might get the added benefit of just like enjoying some um, interaction with people, um, but really like jumping into those different communities that are maybe not the ones, I mean, I don't mean jump in and start conflict, but <laughs> getting in there um, and just bantering about things is going to be a great way to build those skills. Okay. Last question. Um, we're going to have to revisit the Seltzer Facebook group situation later. I have thoughts. Um, best advice you've ever heard someone give a candidate and worst advice you've ever heard someone give a candidate. You can start with either one. Yes. Okay. I'm going to start with the worst. And I think that the worst advice is don't talk about that. It's too personal. And um, I think that the reason why this is the worst advice is because it's really up to the individual to decide what is too personal or what they do or do not want to share. And when what might be something that doesn't land with, you know, one audience or one person could very well be the door that opens you up to so many other people because you're willing to talk about something that is more universal than is necessarily um, kind of out in the world all the time. Um, and so I think that that is probably the worst, um, not just because it's like projecting someone else onto you, but I think it's really limiting. And it's just setting up barriers that you don't necessarily need to have um, as you're deciding how you want to present yourself out in the world. Um, the best piece of advice. So this is interesting because I, I, there's just like so much good advice and they're all different again because candidates are all different. Um, so I'm having trouble coming up with the best piece of advice. Hmm. I, I have one. Best piece of advice if you're a new candidate, connect with Run for something. They'll help you out. Perfect. That was such a good end note. You did it. You did the branding. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Courtney. If people want to stay in touch with you or follow you, where can they find you? Yes. Um, they can find me, well, I mostly tweet about The Bachelor when it's on, so you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Courtney T. Um, my Instagram is more interesting. I'm at Courtney KT there. Um, and if you want to find me at Supermajority, um, you can go to supermajority.com, check out the About Us panel, and you can send me a message or learn more about what we're doing there. And then, of course, the best place to find me is Pantsuit Nation, um, which is searchable on Facebook. So if you go to Facebook and you stick Pantsuit Nation, or excuse me, Pantsuit Nation, um, time super majority since we uh, joined forces last year, which is very exciting. Um, the Facebook group will pop up and you can request to join and um, see what work we're doing in there. Amazing. 
Thank you so much, Court, for having this conversation. I thought it was super interesting. Um, I hope everybody watching on Facebook and in the Zoom enjoyed it as well. Um, two more reminders for you. If you want to contribute to ensure that these events stay free the whole rest of the summer, uh, runforsomething.net slash build is where to go. Thank you for your donation. Um, next week, uh, we'll be doing an armchair chat. With my better partner, uh, Ross Morales Riquetta, will be talking with Emmy Ruiz about campaign management. It is going to be an A++ conversation. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm hyped. Um, so tune in. It will be same time, same place. Uh, take a look in your inbox for the invite on how to get onto the Zoom. Um, but thank you so much, Martin. Thanks for everybody for joining. Have a good rest thank of your Thank you, Amanda. Thanks for having me.